Welcome to section 10.7. So gentle people, in this lecture we're going to discuss Gibbs free energy. Now what Gibbs free energy is, it was decided by a committee of scientists. What they said is that Gibbs free energy, G, is going to be defined by the enthalpy minus T, our temperature, times S, our entropy. Now this again is by definition, they came together and decided what Gibbs free energy was going to be. And you're going to see why they chose what they chose and how Gibbs free energy helps us to determine spontaneity. So if this is my equation right here, what I can do is say that the change in Gibbs free energy is going to equal the change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this equation. I'm going to divide this equation by negative 1 over t. So if I go ahead and divide by negative 1 over t, I am left with this equation right here. Now what you'll notice is we talked about something in our last lecture. We said that negative delta H of our system over temperature, well that's the delta S of our surroundings. So what I can do is I can replace that by delta S of our surroundings. And again, from our last lecture, what you guys might notice is this looks very familiar. If I take the delta S of our surroundings and add the delta S of our system, well, that's going to be the delta S of our universe. Now you guys can see why they chose delta G to be what it is. Delta G is going to be related to delta S of our universe. And remember, delta S of our universe tells me if a process is going to be spontaneous or not. So here's what we can go ahead and think about. If I want my delta S of my universe to be positive for a spontaneous process, and then delta G is related to delta S of universe by a negative sign, well then I can go ahead and just look at delta G and determine if a reaction or process is spontaneous. So this is going to parallel our last table. If a process or reaction has a negative delta G, well then that means the reaction is spontaneous. Meaning if I calculate delta G and there's a negative value associated with it, I have free energy to go ahead and proceed with my process. Now if delta G is greater than zero, that means I have a non-spontaneous process or the reaction won't go or I don't have free energy in my system to proceed with the reaction. If delta G is zero, I'm at equilibrium in a reversible process. Now here's the benefit of looking at delta G. What you guys will note is I'm looking at delta G of my system, and my system is the thing I'm caring about. So what delta G does is it says, don't worry about what's happening with the surroundings, Delta G system accounts for that. Sometimes this is easier to do because remember Delta S universe, I'm looking at what I care about, my system, and what I don't care about, my surroundings, to see if a process is spontaneous. And so that's the benefit of Delta G. I'm solely looking at my system. Now, from now on, if there is no subscript on any thermodynamic term, you can assume it is referring to the system. So if I just write delta G, you can assume that means system or delta G system. So let's go ahead and practice with some quizzes. Go ahead and calculate delta G for this reaction. Here's some thermodynamic values, and I want you to do this at two temperatures so you're going to mark two answers in this quiz. All right, gentle people, we want to calculate a delta G. And we just define delta G as delta H minus T delta S. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in values. So the first place I'm going to evaluate this equation is at 25 degrees Celsius. So let's plug in our values. So delta G equals my delta H. And in this case, my delta H is 53 kilojoules. Now I'm going to subtract, and now I want to put in my temperature. Now what you guys want to pay attention to is units. 
you guys will notice that delta S is usually given per Kelvin. So you should change your temperature to Kelvin. So I'm gonna add 273 to get this into Kelvin. Now I'm gonna go ahead and times it by my delta S. Now here's the other place where you gotta watch out for units. Delta H is usually given in kilojoules. Delta S is usually given in joules. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this 115 joules per Kelvin and convert it into kilojoules per Kelvin. So the delta S given to you in the problem, I'm just gonna divide that by a thousand. So I'm gonna write 0 0.115 kilojoules per Kelvin. So what you guys will see is things are gonna cancel out. My Kelvins cancel out, and this goes ahead and calculates to 18.73 kilojoules. And I'm gonna tell you guys that Gibbs free energy is usually gonna be found in kilojoules. So let's go ahead and evaluate it at a different temperature. So this time around, I wanna evaluate this at 250 degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna start out with my same equation and I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my values. Now you'll notice that delta H and delta S, they don't change very much over temperature. So it's not uncommon to use the same values at a different temperature. So this is still gonna be 53 kilojoules minus 250 plus 273 to get us to Kelvin. And then again, 0 0.115 kilojoules per Kelvin. And so if I go ahead and calculate this out, negative 7.145 kilojoules. Now, what I want you guys to notice is the values that I got. So ask yourself, at 25 degrees, is this reaction spontaneous? What you guys will notice is this reaction has a positive delta G, so this is a non-spontaneous process. It won't go at 25 degrees. However, at 250 degrees, we get a negative value. And remember what a negative value means. A negative delta G means that this reaction is spontaneous, and so this reaction will go at 250 degrees Celsius. So this is part of the reason why you guys go into lab and you start heating up some of your reactions. Some of those reactions may not be spontaneous at room temperature, but if you do heat it up just a bit, all of a sudden those reactions become spontaneous. So here are the two choices that you should have marked. So going off that idea of that last quiz, you can look at delta H and delta S and guess if a reaction is spontaneous. You can also ask yourself what conditions will make a reaction spontaneous. So take a look at this table, but let's go through this thought exercise. So what we're saying is we have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and keep these into two columns, and I'm gonna determine what my delta G is going to be. So let's look at that first scenario. So in my first scenario, what I have is I have a delta H, and it's going to be negative. And my delta S is going to be positive. So let's see what the ramifications of that. So if delta H is negative, I'm just gonna simply put a negative sign, but if delta S is positive, well, I've got a negative sign right here. So if I have a positive delta S, this whole thing in blue, well, that's gonna turn out to be negative. So a negative plus a negative will always be negative. And so that means my reaction will always be spontaneous. It doesn't matter what temperature I'm at, it's a spontaneous reaction. So let's look at the next thing in my table. If I were to go ahead and look at my delta H in this scenario, what they're saying is let's say that delta H is positive. And then let's go ahead and keep our delta S positive. So let's go ahead and see what happens with our equation. Well, delta H is positive. So the red portion of this equation is positive. 
And then if I have a positive delta S, like last time, a positive times a negative is gonna leave me with a negative. Now what you guys will see is that I have a positive and a negative. Now what's gonna happen is, is if this portion, the red portion is bigger, then I'm gonna be positive. If I have this portion bigger, my negative T delta S, then my delta G is gonna be negative. Now the way to increase the blue part of this equation, well, I can change my temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher this blue part is going to be. So what I can say, is that this reaction is gonna be positive or negative. However, if I am at higher temperatures, then I'm gonna have a spontaneous process. If I'm at cooler temperatures, then the red portion of the equation, the delta H is going to dominate, and that means I'm gonna be non-spontaneous. So let's keep looking at our table. Let's go ahead and have a delta H which is negative, and this time I'm gonna make my delta S negative as well. So if that's the case, my delta H in this equation, or the red part, is gonna be negative, and a negative times a negative is going to give me a positive value. So my minus T delta S is gonna be positive with a negative delta S. And again, we have this same scenario my delta G is gonna be positive or negative. So what matters is the size or the magnitude of delta H versus minus T delta S. And now what I wanna do is I wanna minimize the blue part to my equation. And again, temperature is going to change that blue portion of that experiment. In this case, I wanna make this portion of my equation, the blue portion, smaller. That way, the negative is going to dominate. And so to do this, I want to go to lower temperatures. So if I go to lower temperatures, this reaction will become spontaneous. Let's go ahead and tackle the last scenario outlined in that table. And that is, if I have a delta H that is positive and my delta S is negative, the red portion is gonna be positive because delta H is positive. And again, a negative times a negative, my blue portion of my equation is gonna be positive. Now a positive plus a positive is always going to lead to a positive. If delta G is positive, this reaction is non-spontaneous. This reaction will not go at any temperature. It is non-spontaneous everywhere. So this reaction will never happen. Go ahead and see if you can replicate this table by yourselves just to make sure you understand how these thermodynamic values lead to a sign of delta G which will tell you where the reaction is spontaneous. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is entropy versus temperature. So what you guys can do is think about the process of taking something solid and turning it into something that is gaseous. So if you want, take ice and turn it into steam. And you're gonna do this by raising the temperature. So what happens to the entropy as you raise temperature? Well, what you guys have to remember is that if I have a solid, that means I have a very ordered substance. If I start increasing the temperature, remember temperature is a measure of kinetic energy, well, these solids start to vibrate back and forth. If they're vibrating back and forth, well, what you guys will say is that they have a little bit more disorder because they're wiggling around. So as I increase my temperature, the entropy of my system increases. And this gets us to a phase change. So remember what I said before, when I change states of matter, solid to liquid, liquid to gas, the temperature doesn't change during a phase change. It is isothermal. So what you guys will see is that I increase the entropy because I'm going from a solid to a liquid and a liquid is more disordered. So once I'm at my liquid, I increase the temperature. 
increase the kinetic energy, increase the wiggliness, increase the disorder. So my entropy goes up until I hit that other phase change. When I go from a liquid to a gas phase change, my temperature is isothermal or remains the same, but I get a huge jump in entropy because I'm going from a liquid to a gas. A gas is a very chaotic substance. And so that's why you have a huge change in entropy. And then I start to heat up the gas. And what you guys will see is my entropy increases. Now, each of these phase changes, this is going to be the entropy of vaporization, the entropy of fusion, just like when we talked about delta H's. There's a change in our thermodynamic value associated with a phase change. And you will be given this data to work with. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1B, and remember to stay safe.